William Lutz, what is doublespeak? Doublespeak is language designed to evade responsibility, make the unpleasant appear pleasant, the uh, unattractive appear attractive. Basically, it's language that pretends to communicate, but really doesn't. It is language designed to mislead while pretending not to. Is it done consciously? Oh, yes, very consciously. Doublespeak is not a slip of the tongue or a mistaken use of language. It's exactly the opposite. It is language used by people who are very intelligent and very sophisticated in the use of language and know that you can do an awful lot with language. Who's the worst offender? In sheer bulk? Yes. Sheer numbers of examples? The government. If we count government from the local level all the way up to the federal level, I had to stop writing the chapter on government doublespeak. It was going to take over the whole book. But interestingly enough, and this was a revelation in doing the book, about a half a step behind comes business with a tremendous amount of doublespeak. How long has the government been using doublespeak? Um, I think of government as the third oldest profession, and probably from the moment government was instituted, doublespeak came with it. I cite examples from uh, the 5th century B.C. in Greece, um, Julius Caesar, when he pacified Gaul. Of course, uh, Nazi Germany thrived on doublespeak. So it's been around for quite a while. When did you first get interested in this? In... Uh, 1978, I became uh, head of the Committee on Public Doublespeak, and in 1980, I started editing the Quarterly Review of Doublespeak, and that's when I became very interested in it, simply because I, as editing, I have all the examples of doublespeak sent to me, and so I wade through them all. What got you interested in it? My interest in rhetoric. Uh, I did, uh, in my PhD, I did work in rhetoric, and I was interested in rhetoric, and in 1977, I published a textbook called The Age of Communication which was a little different at the time. I tried to examine the rhetoric of television, radio, the mass media, advertising, taking uh, Aristotle's classical rhetoric and apply it to modern media. And I had a lot of fun doing that, and as a result of that textbook, I was asked to join the committee, and I saw rhetoric and language coming all together in doublespeak in an interesting way. Universities also have a problem with doublespeak, don't they? Oh, yes. Oh, uh, I. I continually bite the hand that feeds when I cite uh, Rutgers, and I, at least every issue I have an example from Rutgers University. One of my favorite, we don't have uh, a physical education department at Rutgers. We have a department of human kinetics. Why? Well, I also point out in my book that people in physical education um, have come up with all of these different terms because they've gone professional. They now have their own journals so they have their own academic jargon. And as the dean at Minnesota, who wanted to change the name of his physical education school, said, we're not taken seriously unless we have a name like this. We can't get the grants. We can't publish the articles. How long have you been at Rutgers? Since 1971. What do you teach? Uh, I teach a variety of courses in the English department, but I teach rhetoric, um, linguistics, and some Victorian literature. And I also teach a survey course uh, that's required of all students. We start with the Iliad and the Odyssey and work our way up. Is there any example in history, I mean, ancient history uh, in literature of doublespeak? Yes, I, one I cite just as a passing example is Thucydides in the uh, fifth century BC in the Peloponnesian War. During the war, there was uh, a very vicious civil war in Athens at that time. And Thucydides points out that at that time, the very language itself became corrupted to their own ends. Uh, acts of cowardice became acts of great bravery. Uh, uh, traitorous deeds towards friends became patriotic acts, and he cites the whole list. And it's interesting that Thucydides cites this corruption of language as the ultimate in horror that occurred during that civil war. Do you ever personally find yourself using doublespeak? Oh, yeah. W when I was uh, uh, head of the department, I had to engage in doublespeak. You, you have to write uh, recommendations. You have to write personnel evaluation forms. I had to pitch for more money. And so you use the doublespeak of bureaucracy, as anyone else. If I were uh, a bureaucrat who, were, who, who would function within the bureaucracy using straight language, um, I wouldn't be taken seriously. It, it's a sort of ritualistic use of language. Are you in this whole world of doublespeak because you want to get rid of it? Oh, yes. I, uh, I don't think you'll ever get rid of it. I don't think we can. It is inherent in the function of language, to, to use language, to 
as a weapon or as a tool to manipulate other people. However, I think there are two things we can do. First of all, we can all become much more aware of this language. We should be aware of it so that we can at least be defensive and, and defend ourselves so that we're not misled through it. But secondly, there are times when we simply cannot tolerate this language. When we talk about important public issues of national policy, we should not use doublespeak as a nation. We should not use it ourselves. We should not allow the politicians who are speaking to us to use it. Language that way can be terribly corrupting in a society and can mislead all of us. And in a democracy that depends upon the active participation of its citizens, it can lead to cynicism and resentment and a withdrawal from the political process. Is that, does that have anything to do with the reason why the only 50% of the American people voted in 1988? I have a, a hypothesis that I would love to test, and, and I hope sometime to be able to do that. I would love to, to be able to track the pervasiveness of doublespeak as it grew, along with the decline in voting. Because the reaction I get to doublespeak from a lot of, uh, of readers of the Quarterly Review as they write to me is, well, of course I know this language. I see it all over the place. I see it all the time. But, you know, what, what else can you expect from politicians? They all lie. They all use doublespeak. It is that cynicism which leads to there's nothing I can do about it, so people withdraw and pull back. This book uh, is in the bookstores? Yes, it is. It's 1795? Yes. Uh, how'd you do this book? I did the book. Uh, and somebody asked me, how long did it take you to write the book? I said it took me 10 years to research it and six months to write it. I sat down and tried to make sense out of all the doublespeak that I've been collecting because there is a, a tendency to have a perception that it is scattered here, hither and yon. The function of the book is to gather it and focus it to show you that there is a pattern and a progression to this language. And I structured the book to have a lot of fun in the beginning and the humorous uses of doublespeak, but leading to the more important uses of doublespeak by government, the Pentagon, and the issues of nuclear war and peace, and how doublespeak corrupts that whole process. A couple little things. How did you choose Harper and Rowe? Uh, Actually, it, there were two or three publishers, and I chose Harper & Row because of the editor at Harper & Row, Hugh Van Dusen, who was one of the most respected editors in, in the profession. And it was someone I thought would understand the book and would um, help me uh, focus it and guide it. And that's why I, I went with Harper & Row. Did you name it? Well, yes, I did. Uh, I, I had a whole bunch of titles. And I was, I was advised not to call it doublespeak to come up with some other kind of descriptive title, but I wanted to, because a lot of people aren't sure what they mean by doublespeak, so I put the subhead in there, from revenue enhancement to terminal living. People recognize that immediately. They, they may not be quite sure what doublespeak is, but boy, they know what revenue enhancement is in terminal living. They've seen enough of that language around. Is it selling? It's in the fourth printing. What's that mean? It means that they sold out the first printing, they sold out the second printing, they sold out the third printing, and they're into the fourth, and the bookstores can't keep it on the shelves. Um, a lot of bookstores don't have it because it's back-ordered. Um, they sell them as fast as they can get them in the stores. How big is it printing? Well, the first printing was 17,500. The um, second and third printings were 6,000 copies each. And I think the third printing was bigger, but I'm not sure how much. Uh, I haven't found out how much that is. So it's at least another 6,000. Have you had any feedback? Uh, the feedback I've gotten from reviewers, uh, which generally like the book, um, the only thing I've been faulted for is my humor. I guess I'm a little too funny at times for their taste. The, uh, otherwise, the response from the press has been interesting. Awful lot of reporters. Associated Press did two stories on the book. Uh, there were wire press stories in England, and you can't even buy the book in England, and I've done interviews with the BBC, and a friend of mine who lives in Ireland called me up and said it's, it was all in the newspapers there. Um, and he said, you can't even buy the book here, and they, they were all interested in it. So the press, the, the working press, has been fascinated by the book, and I've gotten a lot more reaction from the press than I have from the traditional book reviewers. Have you been on the book tour? Yes, I've done the book tour. And I'm an academic. This is my ninth book, but it's my first trade book. I was unprepared for the world of trade publishing. My wife is a novelist. She's done two novels. She knows the world of trade publishing, and she has cautioned me about it. What's the word trade mean? Trade, uh, as opposed to academic. You go into the bookstore, and, and you can buy the book. Academic publishing is done by University Press and is more restricted, and you won't find these generally in the bookstore. And it's a much smaller audience and smaller press run. 
um, it's, this is mass market, this is writing to the public. And so when I did the book tour, I, I was introduced into the world of, of trade publishing. I found it fascinating when I was in Washington, D.C. for my tour. Just ahead of me was um, Justice uh, Judge Bork, and just behind me was uh, William Colby. We were all making the tour, uh, pushing our books. And uh, you would go, go from radio station to TV station to press interview, and, and uh, I found it a fascinating world. I met a lot of other authors. I met Steve Allen and a few other people, but we're all pushing the book. It doesn't make any difference who you are. What surprised you most about the, the book tour? Uh, it is tough. It's, it's physically demanding. It's mentally exhausting. And everyone does it. It doesn't matter. Uh, Emma Baumbach, uh, Steve Allen, big names that you would think, name alone would sell the book. They're out there doing exactly the same tour. And I think that that's important, though, because I get a sense of audience when I talk to interviewers and you talk to a variety of people. You see how your writing is perceived. A writer never really knows what the audience sees in the text. So every time I went in, I would be asked something about the book that I hadn't even thought about or something that I didn't think was significant or important or particularly interesting. I had just put in there for whatever reason. They thought was the most fascinating thing and zeroed in on it. What's the most often asked question? The chapter on food and food doublespeak. Everyone goes after that one about, is it true that, that you can put sugar free on a product and still have sugar in it? Is probably the one question I've been asked most often because people simply can't believe that that, that happens. How can it happen? Because sugar free simply means they haven't added table sugar or cane sugar to it. They can add manos, fructose, any of the uh, syrup sweeteners and still call it sugar free. So, you know, when you eat something that's sugar-free, there's sugar in it. Oh, yes. And by the way, I found out in a radio uh, interview when they had uh, people in the audience calling in, a man called in and said, D do you mean that there's sugar in there? I said, well, yes, there's sugars in that food. He said, well, I'm a diabetic, and my wife makes sure she buys only the sugar-free. I said, you can't eat those. You have to use only the dietetic because that's governed by law. Sugar-free isn't. Here's a man who was threatening his health through this, this kind of false labeling. It was absolutely amazing. But the, the food chapter has really, I guess we're all interested in food for some reason. I've been asked endless questions on that chapter. Is there a particularly unusual question that you were asked on one of those call-in shows? Uh, usually on the call-in shows, people call in to give me their examples of doublespeak, which is, uh, I always like because I get to write things down. But uh, the most unusual question I think I was asked was, um, I'm trying to think of how he put it. Um, he wanted to know how many examples of doublespeak, to that effect, if there was an account. He wanted to know if I'd counted it. And, uh, you know, I'd never even thought of that. And I have no idea of how many examples I have. Because I, all of the examples that I, that I gather, I, I have in a computer database so I can... Uh, call them up quickly and search very quickly. I have no idea how many I have in there. I do know I have a lot. Any part of the country that was more interested than others? Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, was far more interested uh, in it than, uh, than any other parts of the country. It was interesting. When Harper and Row went to market the book, there was very little interest in it by West Coast distributors. There was a minimal interest in it. I, I think they took copies simply because the first print run was so large, they figured you can't really ignore a book like that. But they weren't. In fact, I had phone calls from Los Angeles. Um, George Carlin uh, uses a lot of uh, the doublespeak in, in his routines, and he always credits me. And he called me up and he said, I want your book, but I can't find it. <laughs> I said, try ordering it. Uh, he couldn't even get it in his bookstore, and he, he said he was trying to get the bookstore to, to stock it for me. So uh, the, that part of the country wasn't interested, but the Midwest was interested, but the East Coast, New York and Washington, D.C., the book took off immediately. Is there anything to the, the, the possibility that uh, because we here in this town are the champions of doublespeak, we, do we know we're the champions of doublespeak and can't get out of it? I think it, it's that... Uh, people in, in, in Washington, D.C. that I meet kind of proud about that. Well, we really know this stuff. Cabbies tell me this. When I, you know, you're here for the book tour, what's your book? And I tell them, boy, we know that. And the cabbies will start giving me examples. Uh, I think people in Washington, D.C. and New York are extremely sensitive to language. 
they live in a language environment that is probably more intense than other sections of the country, and they're more aware of it. So I think the book struck a responsive chord for that reason. Um, I find that people, a couple of people that I've talked to, the first thing they did when they got the book, they'll pick it up and they'll look, there's an index of doublespeak terms, to see if their favorite term is in there. That's the first thing they want to know. And then they'll say, well, you didn't include, and, and uh, that's the reaction. It's a personal reaction. You, it seemed like you self-consciously pointed out in the, in the early part of this book that there are no footnotes. Is that because you are an academician and you always had footnotes yes. in all yes. the other books? Um, <clears throat> I, 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 I write footnotes a lot. And I think I wanted to reach a, a wide audience, and I had a choice. Either I could, even documenting it, by the way, putting the footnotes in the back and end notes, anybody reading a text that sees all these little numbers all the way through it, it they just don't, uh, I think that it, it scares them off, and, and it changes the whole tone of the work. So I wanted to say, all of these examples are real. I can document all of them, but I'm not going to include the documentation here. And in those instances where I've been asked to document them, I've documented them. It's only got 290 pages, small book. I think it's long, actually, for the material. It's pretty dense material. And the challenge in the book was to make it readable. I didn't want it to be just a listing of terms. I wanted to show that there's a coherence to this, first of all, and secondly, that this can be fun and enjoyable to read at the same time that it's educational. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with laughing and learning at the same time, and that's the kind of book that I wanted to write. What are the other books? That you've done. You don't have to go through every one of them, but what, in general, what well, areas? Well, at the same time that I published that, I published a, uh, a collection of essays on doublespeak uh, by the National Council of Teachers of English, in which I asked a, a group of scholars to each contribute an essay on an aspect of doublespeak. So I edited those and published that book. I edited the uh, revised edition of the Webster's New World Thesaurus, published by Simon & Schuster. I'm probably one of the few people who has ever read the dictionary from cover to cover twice. And, uh, and, I, and I edited that thesaurus. And then uh, a variety of, uh, of textbooks on rhetoric and on writing, and uh, a book on revolution and revolutionary theory. What did you learn when you read that dictionary from cover to cover? Boy, did I learn a lot about words. <laughs> uh, I learned a lot of archaic words, a lot of archaic definitions. But uh, you know the dictionary is fascinating to read. You can pick it up and flip it open and start reading. A good dictionary. Too many of the desk dictionaries are so edited down that there's no life to the language or life to words. If you get a, a good desk dictionary that, that gets into the backgrounds of the words and, and the words in context, uh, words are fascinating and fun and language comes alive on the page. And in writing the thesaurus, you get into the, the shades of meaning, the nuances and, and the power of words um, and the images that they can, they can create in your mind. What are the best dictionaries? Uh, well, there's the unabridged is, is the dictionary you always want of reference. What does that mean, unabridged? Unabridged means absolutely everything is in there. They have edited out nothing. Uh, every definition, every meaning of the word, every example, which is why the unabridged is about that thick. The, a good, all the dictionaries that we deal with are abridged, which means that they take out a lot of the specialized words and, and try to boil it down to a core of words that are everyday usage, and then they'll cut back even the meanings of the words. Even in the thesaurus, um, a word like fix, a verb fix, can have up to 28 different meanings. But you normally don't list all 28. You'll, you'll maybe pick 14 or 12 of common usage. So, uh, What's the difference between a dictionary and a thesaurus? A dictionary gives you the meanings of the words, uh, all, the, all the meanings and a strict definition for each one. A thesaurus gives you synonyms for the word. So if you want to look up uh, the adjective busy, you want synonyms for that word, um, words that say the same thing, but not quite, shades of meaning. One of the phrases I gave was in conference. Uh, I just had an experience a couple weeks ago where somebody saw one of these shows and, and criticized me for using a word incorrectly. And I think the word was uh, parochial. I was referring to something that was, you know, special for a small group, mm -hmm. parochial. And she said, That's, you're just not using it. Or the word is provincial. So I trotted off to my dictionary and found out that I was right. And so was yeah. she. Yes. So how do you, how, who writes these things? And I mean, who writes the dictionary in the first place? Um, lexicographers write it. The World Dictionary is produced in Cleveland. If you go to Cleveland, Ohio, 
you will find uh, in a building downtown that there's a floor that Simon & Schuster has for their dictionary staff. And there's a group of people who sit around and they read. They read magazines, newspapers, and they look for words and new meanings of words. And these are pulled out and entered into the computer. And that's, that's what you do. And, and what company is, is Simon & Schuster? Who, what's the name on that dictionary? Um, Webster's New World Dictionary. Unabridged. Um, they're working on an unabridged. The, unab the unabridged, I'm not sure when the next date is coming out. They have a huge um, collection of new meanings and new words. And whenever they pick those out, they have to take the sentence in which it was used, what's called the citation, so that the meaning is perfectly clear in that sentence for that shade of meaning. W one of the things that I did in my book, I learned from them. All of my examples of doublespeak are not only real, but I have the original context in which the phrase occurred, or I won't use it. So I have file drawers filled with clippings and memos and letters that have been sent to me in which the word is used in context so that I can see that the example of doublespeak is real, it's serious, and how it is used. And that's the only way that I'll accept an example. Uh, I'll get off this dictionary in a second, but this is interesting. What, uh, how many people are involved in, in producing the Webster's Unabridged Dictionary? Oh, gosh, there's a lot of people. This is a big undertaking. You'll have, um, I met the senior editorial staff that I met consisted of eight people. These are the senior editors. And below them will be all kinds of other editors and, and uh, uh, citation checkers and any number of people. You're talking a lot of people to do this. The, the, I suppose it sells... Millions of copies? Or? Well, it will sell over you know, a period of uh, the life of the book um, will, will be 20, 30, 40 years, and then periodically updating it uh, as they go along. But it is uh, labor-intensive. Computers have really helped. They used to keep all these citations and index cards, by the way, in boxes. Now, of course, they can keep it in a computer database and pull things together. The Random House Dictionary was the first dictionary produced by computer. Um, when they brought out the Random House uh, Desk Dictionary. That was the first one. Webster's, Random House, other names? Let's see, there's Webster's, there's Random House, New, uh, Ameri uh, American Heritage. Uh, those are probably the three best uh, dictionaries. Oh, then there's the Webster's Seventh um, uh, Collegiate uh, Dictionary. What's that mean? Just seventh just edition? Name. Seventh edition. Now they're up to the ninth edition or something. It's Webster's, whatever number they use. What about overseas? Oxford. Do they have a dictionary? Well, there's the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the ultimate dictionary in the world. Um, that's just uh, a joy and a delight to read. It's, it traces the entire history of a word, from its first occurrence in English all the way through, giving you the dates, the, cita the source, and the citation. You can look up a word and find it its, its entire history. If you go to the OED, as it's called, uh, you can look up the word nun in nunnery, and you will understand why when, uh, when Hamlet turns to Ophelia and says, get thee to a nunnery, you know, she runs off the stage in tears. If you go to the OED and look up uh, the meaning for nunnery at the time uh, of, of Hamlet when the play was written, you'll find out that it meant brothel. Uh, Double Speak is your book, and you say it's in its fourth printing. Who, I mean, do, do you want this to change anything, this specific book, and have you seen any evidence that, you know, besides the journalists and the call-in shows and all that kind of stuff, that somebody's taking this book and using it to change things? Hey, boy, what a great question to ask. I just got a clipping, a newspaper clipping, um, in which there's a letter to the editor quoting my book um, to support the argument uh, that the person is making about deceptive language. So, uh, as my mother said, when she sent me this clipping, she ran across it and she said, somebody bought your book and read it, it seems. Uh, I would hope that I will change things by, pr I produce what I like to think of as a, um, a handbook for survival in the 20th century, in the, in the age of the media, so that people will become critical consumers of language. You know, we talk about the consumer movement where you have to be aware of the product that you buy when you go and, uh, and purchase something. You have to be aware of the language that's used in our society. You are just as much, as, as much a consumer of language as you are a consumer of goods. And so you have to be a critical consumer of language, just as you're a critical shopper. And if you run across language that defe that's defective, take it back, just like you take back the defective toaster and say, I want an exchange on this one. Give me language that works. Give me clear language. In your acknowledgments, uh, something popped out of the page. Uh, I would like to thank the gracious women of the Four Arts Club of Elkhart, Indiana, 
who listened to an early version of chapter two and laughed at all the right places. Tell yeah. us more. Oh, that was, um, I had been uh, interviewed on the Today Show and a woman called me up from Elkhart, Indiana and said that they had this, this club and they would love to have me come and talk. And I, and I said, I'm really too busy. And, but they were so, so nice, I finally gave in and, and went and had an absolutely wonderful time. The Four Arts Club in Elkhart, Indiana, by the way, is very impressive. It's a very large group of uh, women who are dedicated to the arts. They have their own arts center, and they work very hard at supporting the arts and do a very, very good job of it. And I was their luncheon speaker. And I was in the midst of writing this book, and I had no idea of my audience, um, who was reading this and would be responding to this. And that's very difficult. So I took along chapter two, and I read a chunk of chapter two as my talk. And I apologized. I said I should probably give you a prepared talk of a particular kind, but I would like to read this. And they did indeed laugh. And then afterwards, as, as part of the, uh, of the luncheon, there is a reception line where I, I met each one of them, and uh, they each thanked me for coming. And the, the, and the audience was two or three hundred people, by the way. But they were so wonderful in, in telling me what they thought of what I had, had just read of the, from this manuscript, what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. So uh, uh, I was really gracious to them. Here's what chapter two uh, is all about. There are putic misadventures, the economically non-affluent and deep chilled chickens, the double speak of everyday life, everyday living, excuse me. What is, what, what is a therapeutic misadventure? Um, I will tell you the incident, and then you can figure it out. In 1982, during a cesarean operation, the uh, anesthetist turned the wrong knob and killed the mother and child. The hospital called this a therapeutic misadventure. Uh, three weeks ago in Los Angeles, according to the Los Angeles Times, in a series of incidents that the pathologist called incredible stupidity and incompetence, the uh, surgeons killed the patient. It included slitting the patient's throat during surgery. This was called a therapeutic misadventure. How about economically non-affluent? That's what the president of the City University of New York called the poor students uh, attending the City University. They came from economically non-affluent families. Deep chilled chickens. Uh, Frank Perdue uh, filed a complaint with the Department of Agriculture that his competitors were selling frozen chickens as fresh. And the Department of Agriculture investigated and said, no, um, granted the chickens are packed in ice at a temperature of 28 degrees Fahrenheit. These are not frozen chickens. These are merely deep chilled chickens and can therefore be sold as fresh. I suggested that we pack the same Department of Agriculture bureaucrats in ice. When they hit 28 degrees, we might ask them if they're deep chilled or frozen. You point out that there may be as many as one billion people in the world that speak English. Yes, that's the, the estimate is 750 to one billion who speak English as a first or second language. Why English? It's become, uh, well, you know, it's simply from both the British Empire and then we replaced the, the British as the dominant uh, economic and political force in the world. And it's natural in history that that nation which has the greatest political and economic influence, that language is adopted uh, by all people in the world. Rome had the same function, Latin uh, functioned the same way. And so uh, if you saw the story of English uh, that uh, McNeil did, uh, Robert McNeil did, he has the great episode where he goes to the shipyard in Singapore. And you have a shipbuilding yard in Singapore where the, the people ordering the ships are from Japan. They're Japanese. The workers are Singapore natives. The financing is coming from Hong Kong. And somebody else is, uh, from the United States has an interest in it. They all speak English, every one. It's the one language that they can all share so they don't have to worry about other languages. So it's become the, what's called by linguists the lingua franca, the language of trade and commerce in the world. Uh, I've just been here trying to total it up. You've got 250 million Americans, 58 million Brits, 17 million Australians, 26 million Canadians. Do all the Indians in India speak English? A great number of Indians speak English, great number of people in China, Japan. Um, you can go to um, particularly the Far East, in the Near East and find a lot of people. Go to Greece. One of the uh, television channels in Greece is all English. 
um, it, it's, it's broadcast in English. What about the Soviet Union? Oh, a large number, too, in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, when I, w I taught in China for a while, and my students were all, uh, they not only spoke English, uh, they were learning to, to write proficiently in English, that they would have a mastery of the written language, which is extremely difficult when you learn a foreign language. And for them, becoming very proficient in English was important for their economic success. One of my students had as his goal to be a high-level government translator, for example. Um, at the very least, they could be tourist guides and, and have other functions. But being proficient, and English wasn't their only language, by the way. They had to know at least two. Most of my students were proficient in English and Russian. But for them, English was extremely important. And many of them wanted to be able to study in England or America or a similar country. And proficiency in English would allow them to do that. Do you ever, did you ever study another language? Oh, yes. Um, my minors, um, as an undergraduate, were Latin and Greek. And then uh, I also learned uh, some German as a reading language for my doctorate. Is English easy or difficult? As a linguist, no language is any easier or more difficult than any other language, a linguist will tell you. As a practical matter, uh, in pronunciation, after you reach a certain age of maturity, you will never be able to speak a language like a native speaker because your, your, your physical uh, properties of producing speech will, will evolve in such a way that you can't produce uh, certain sounds as accurately as a native speaker. It's, it's simply a physiological fact of life but you can still learn that language. What you really learn when you learn a language, and this is why you should learn a foreign language, you learn a whole different way of looking at the world. It, it's, it's tied in with doublespeak. Language is a way of perceiving reality. It's the only way we have of, of looking out there, seeing something, and turning to another person and saying, this is what I see. Now, we can both look out there, and you can say, I see a pre-dawn vertical insertion, and I can say, gee, I see an invasion. But it's through language that we talk about this reality and we give some kind of, of, of means of expressing that reality. When you learn a foreign language, you will learn a slightly different way of looking at the world and interpreting that world. Chinese is fascinating because Chinese is so different from English. Uh, the Chinese don't have pronouns. They don't have gender in their pronouns. It is impossible in Chinese to say, um, well, my son, he is going. Uh, they just don't have that. They don't have is going, what we call the present progressive tense. It does not exist in Chinese. The, the verb tense becomes different. Uh, number becomes different. English is, uh, we have singular and plural, and we never even think of that. Plural is defined as two or more. In many languages, plural is three or more. There's singer, single, dual, meaning just two, and then plural, which is three or more. It's a different way of seeing things and dealing with things, which is why it's always interesting to learn another language. Although I do think at times that doublespeak is in a different language, but probably doesn't qualify as a foreign language. At the beginning, again at the preface, you uh, quote George Orwell. Um, and the reason I mention this is because you, in Appendix C, you give uh, the list of recipients of the George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contributions to Honesty and Clarity in Public Language. Talk about that in a second. George Orwell, from Politics and English Language, 1946. Most people who bother with the matter at all would admit that the English language is in a bad way. Uh, Orwell's throughout this entire book. Why did you pick him? Well, Orwell, in, in, in his two works, uh, his essay, politics in the English language, and then really giving full-blown full, full blown, uh, thought to that essay in his novel, 1984, addressed the importance of language in society and the control and manipulation of language to control and direct uh, society. I think the most important point in 1984 is that power grows not out of the barrel of a gun. Power grows not out of the uh, thought police and rule by terror. It grows out of the power of language in that novel. The revolutionary act committed by Winston Smith right at the beginning of that novel is to keep a diary. In keeping a diary, any person who keeps a diary uses language to communicate with the self. You're talking to yourself and you're thinking through words about the world around you and about how you feel. That's why a diary is such a revolutionary act in 1984, because you are reasserting personal control over language. 
Then at the end of the novel, to parallel that scene, when Winston Smith has been found out and O'Brien, his torturer and guide, says to him, what is reality? Reality is not external. Reality exists not in the mind of the individual, which soon perishes, but in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. What the party says is reality is real. And how else can the party do that? Except by language. The party has taken control of language and has taken it away from the individual. And that's the power, because those in power who control language control the way we see the world. Let's talk about political parties just for a second. Let, let me name three for you and, and tell me which one is the worst abuser of doublespeak. The Communist Party, the Democratic Party, or the Republican Party in history. I, I would say, I'd give them all three. They're right in there by the nature of, uh, of politics. I would say that the Communist Party um, would be leading the other two simply because uh, under the time of Stalin and others, language was used to justify you know, mass murder murder of millions of people, exactly the same as the Nazis did. You know, use, use a language to justify murder. But as we see, any, any politician in power starts using doublespeak. The Democrats did. Right? I love Jimmy Carter's uh, comment on the failed raid to free the hostages in Iran. He called it an incomplete success. He did that without even thinking about it. He, it, he was just automatically using that kind of language. But we had used language in Vietnam to justify our actions in Vietnam. Uh, the Republican Party, once at attaining power, has used uh, doublespeak to justify and explain and, and silence their critics. But I don't see that as being different from any other politician. Uh, what Orwell says in politics in the English language is, it is clear that the corruption of language has ultimately has political and economic causes. Who are your favorite people in the world that, that have used language over the years that you, you think use less doublespeak than a lot of the others that are in this book? Um, I'm not sure about less doublespeak. I think, I think more of people who were aware of the power of language and how to use it and use it effectively. Um, or, or maybe I should ask you, who are the straight shooters? Who are the people that you say really give um, it to a straight? And language. hit you between the eyes? Boy, that's a tough question because the closest I could come would be um, right now, uh, Colin Powell, um, for his, his, uh, his explanation of the, uh, of the war, my term, in, uh, in Panama. For uh, there have been a few politicians who have been quite blunt. Uh, Senator Moynihan can when he chooses to be. He can also use doublespeak, but he can be pretty blunt when he wants to be and, and pretty forceful. There are a few people in, in, in Congress and the House of Representatives who, when they choose, can be quite blunt. What I find interesting about that use of language, those are people who are very conscious of when it is the ritualistic doublespeak that they're going to use and when they think they can achieve more by using blunt language. So they can turn it on and turn it off. John Kennedy understood the power of rhetoric. Um, this isn't to say he didn't use doublespeak, which he did, but he understood that, that language had the power to move us and to inspire us and to set a public agenda and define ourselves as a nation. And we haven't seen such language in quite a while. Harry Truman was probably the bluntest speaker we ever had as a president um, for, for not caring about the consequences, he, he, he would just say. And I think we have looked back on him now and said, boy, you know, he, he really was pretty straightforward. I have a rule about presidents and uh, presidential speeches. I do not watch them when they are given. I read the text of the speech first. Then I watch the speech so that I am not influenced by all of the visual trappings that go with the speech. And if you look at the words in the page, you'll get a quite different message quite often than the message you'll get from the visual image. I did that with um, Oliver North's testimony. Uh, which comes across quite different on the printed page. Uh, Harry Truman's comments now seem blunter than ever uh, when read on the printed page. Uh, Richard Nixon um, doesn't seem quite as flat on the printed page as he was in life because I think his persona uh, overshadowed his words. And at times uh, his language 
it isn't as duplicitous as some people thought it was in some instances, although he was capable, as we saw during Watergate, of, of using a lot of doublespeak. So there's, there's always a mixture of language because anyone who reaches any position of power must either instinctively or knowingly know how to use doublespeak and know how to use it at a certain time and when to turn it on and off and to what degree. You, you can simply track that in anyone um, in the rise to power. Uh, I'm trying to think of the great Spencer Tracy movie. Um, it's a classic film where he's running for president. He's the ordinary man who gets caught up in the presidential race and he becomes a national hero. And one of the things they do in the movie is show that as he moves closer to getting the nomination, he starts using more and more of what we would call doublespeak until finally there comes a scene at the end of the movie when he gets so disgusted with what he has become that he quits the race and will not, even though he has by this point become a shoe in for the nomination if not the election he just quits it but the movie has traced the compromises that he makes through language in order to achieve it and i think that uh... the, the american public believes that that in order to get that far you have to sell off so much that there's not much left at the other end and that is reflected in the language that you use. When you write, uh, where do you write? I have, uh, fortunate to have my own little study. I have one. I'm on one side of the hall. My wife is on the other side doing her next novel. And um, I have a computer and sit and, and um, write um, trying to do uh, as much as I can. I have a rule about writing, uh, which I discovered when I wrote my dissertation, that you never, you never write a book. You write three pages, or you write five pages. Uh, otherwise, I, I put off writing my dissertation for a year because I couldn't think of writing this whole thing. And then I discovered that you don't write a book, you write three pages. And I had put off doing this book for quite a while, and my wife said, you've got to do the book. And I said, yes, I'm going to, I, just as soon as I and, of course, I did every other thing I could possibly think of before that. And then I realized one day that she was right. I had to start writing. But I was thinking of writing a book. Every time I start a book, I go through this. So one day, I sit down and I say, I'm going to write five pages. That's all. And when I'm done with five pages, I'll reward myself. And so I do the five pages. Or the next time, I'll do ten pages or, or whatever number of pages. But I set a number of pages. And uh, after a period of time, you have a manuscript. Do you write a lot at one time? It depends. Um, there have been, when I was writing that book, I, I came downstairs and said, gee, I just did 28 pages, which is a phenomenal amount of writing. But I, I hit a section where it just really flowed. And I always begin a writing session by sitting down and rewriting what I wrote the previous day. And that's the first thing. And it does two things. First of all, it makes your writing a little bit better because rewriting is the essential part of writing. And the second thing is get you flowing again, get you back into the mainstream. Truman Capote once gave the best piece of advice for writers ever given. He said, never pump the well dry. Always leave a bucket there. So I would never stop writing when I ran out of ideas. I always stopped when I had something more to write about. And I would write a note to myself. This is what I'm going to do next. And then I stopped. The worst feeling in the world is to have written yourself dry and then have to come back the next day knowing that you're dry and not knowing where you're going to pick up at this point. Do you write at home? Yes. All the time? Yes. And home. where is home? It's in a little town called Haddon Township, New Jersey, which is right outside of Philadelphia. Is there a certain environment, uh, late evening, early morning, dark room, all those things that make it easier for you? There is an environment, that's true. I, I, I once wrote an essay on this, by the way. I was asked to contribute to a book called uh, How I Write, and they asked a group of writers to describe it. And in writing about how I write, first time I ever thought about it, I realized that there is a ritual that I engage in in writing, and I think every writer does. You have to have a certain environment. I like my office, and it has to be, and it has to be clean. When it gets too messy, I can't write, so I'll spend a day cleaning it up. And then, uh, generally, I have to start either in the morning or in the late evening, one or the other. The middle of the day seems to be a bad time for me. I'll waste a lot of time in the middle of the day. But I can write late at night or I can write early in the morning, get up and get started. My wife writes very late at night. I mean, she's the person who says, it's 2 o'clock, it's time to start writing. Um, and she can write from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. 
it's absolutely amazing. How did you two get together? Um, she, when she published, she had been a graduate student in the English department when I was chairman. And um, after she published her first novel, uh, she'd given me a copy and, um, you know, was a former graduate uh, who had gone on to success and were quite proud. And uh, so I, I asked her out to dinner and a um, few years later, <laughs> we were married. And, uh, Is it, it, it two writers together, does it work? She says it doesn't. Um, and she said, why did I ever marry a writer? I, I know I should have never married a writer. Because she's a novelist and she creates, you know, and, and the creative process of writing a novel is quite different from writing nonfiction. Um, I've learned an awful lot about writing. Uh, and I've learned an awful lot about literature from her, from watching her write uh, and watching the creative process at work. And uh, when she... she um, goes to writing conferences and, and sometimes I go with her and she and there are other writers novelists there talking and they all talk the same way to watch a novelist write a novel is is tremendously impressive I don't think I have ever appreciated as much the the creative act as that to create a world to create people that are real in a novel and these people uh, as she explains to me and, and and to her students in her creative writing classes, what you see in the novel is about one-tenth of what the novelist knows about these people in this world. She could tell you absolutely everything there is to know about these characters, where they went to school, what their favorite foods are. That may never be in the novel, but she has to know these people that well in order to, to write about them in a novel, and a novelist knows that. And so a lot of her writing will be she has a couch in her office, and she'll just be lying on the couch two, three hours because it just, it, it, there's, the, there's the gestation period going on of these people coming to life, and then she'll write for a while, and then she'll go back to thinking. And to watch this process, boy, that's a piece of cake for me to write. I mean, this is, this is nothing, and I wouldn't want to be a novelist for anything. There's too much pain and suffering and, uh, and just damn hard work in writing a novel. In the liner notes, it says, quote, Bill Lutz is the 1990 George Orwell, uh, Larry King. Which Larry King is that? That's Larry King. Larry King. I was, I was on a show twice, and um, uh, we had a lot of fun uh, in doing the book. And, and when, I, when the book came out, I had sent him a, a copy, and he was kind enough to give me that blurb. But um, in the first time I was on his show, we spent two hours going through doublespeak and with people calling in and that, and, and he really enjoyed it. The reason I ask is that I want you to go back to the George Orwell thing, because we want to talk a little bit about the awards and the time we have remaining. Who was George Orwell? George Orwell was a, a British essayist, reviewer, critic, novelist, uh, who published the now classic novel, 1984. But uh, in 1947, he published uh, Politics in the English Language, an essay which, by the way, is the most reprinted essay in the English language. It's just, it's just endlessly reprinted, in which he warned about the, the corruption of thought through language. The examples he used all came from uh, uh, Stalinist Russia and Nazi Germany. He had, during the Second World War, served in the British Ministry of Propaganda or Information and was introduced to the inside of the propaganda process. And he wrote 1984 as a novel of the future in which uh, given the growth of the power of communications and the sophisticated use of language, totalitarian governments would base their power upon the control of minds through language. And he really believed that. When did he die? He died in 1948 um, uh, of uh, lung disease. You think he would have, if he'd lived, he'd have been surprised uh, about two things. One, the popularity of 1984 as a novel and two, what actually happened in those totalitarian governments in 1989? He, oh, uh, by both of those. First of all, um, th there's a, a whole discussion over why this novel became so popular. It was originally titled, by the way, The Last Man in Europe. And it got the title 1984 by flipping the last two digits of um, 48. Oh, by the way, he died in 49 because he died right after the novel came out. The novel did only modestly well. After he died, however, it got tremendously popular. He also published Animal Farm, um, that classic, which was soundly denounced by the, uh, by the Communist Party and also got a, a lot of press. 
But it wasn't until after his death that the novel became as popular as it was. In 1984, that novel sold 50,000 copies a week in the United States. In 1984? In 1984, in the year of 1984. Did the fact the novel exist, uh, existed or, or exists, have any impact on making sure that it really didn't happen? Well, during 1984, there were, you know, of course, a flurry of conferences and discussions about, you know, has the world of 1984 come to pass? And, of course, there were people who said, no, look at we haven't. And on the other hand, people said, oh, yes, it has. Um, that's a judgment call. I think that uh, in some ways it's far worse than the world that Orwell envisioned. On the other hand, it's not as bad as he envisioned. The events in, in Eastern Europe show us that it is becoming almost impossible to control the information environment as tightly as Orwell envisioned it. The only country I can think of that can do that now is North Korea. They're the only one that is complete, they're hermetically sealed from the rest of the world. Romania is trying to be hermetically sealed, and I don't know how successful they will be. But as the Chinese government found out, the existence of telephones and fax machines and personal computers simply makes it impossible to, to control language and therefore ideas in the way that Orwell saw it in 1984. But I think that what governments have done is they've just gone a step beyond that. They will let the information flow. They will just try and control the way that the content of that flow of information. Now, the George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contribution to Honesty and Clarity in Public Language, uh, Donald Bartlett, or Barlett, Barlett, and James Steele, reporters for the Philadelphia Inquirer in 88? Yes. Oh, uh, in 88, it was uh, Edward Herman, professor of finance at the, uh, oh, that was 88. I that was 88. 89. They did a series of articles in the Philadelphia Inquirer on the tax reform bill showing that through false deceptive language that was inserted in, into the bill, billions of dollars in special tax breaks were given away to individuals and uh, companies and corporations. And it was all done through, through deceptive language that no one knew understood the language. It was written in such a way that it applied only to one individual. Great example. Um, one business was defined as a family farm in that bill, thereby giving them the special tax breaks for farmers. That business employs 25,000 people and has a gross income of over $1.5 billion a year. The tax bill called him a family farm. 87 was Noam Chomsky for On Power and Ideology. 86 was Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, 85 was Torben Vertergaard and uh, Kim Schroeder. Yeah, they're two Danish uh, uh, professors. And one more, 84, was Ted Koppel, moderator of ABC's television program, Nightline. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, who gives the George Orwell Award and what's usually the, the reason? Well, the, the Committee on Public Doublespeak of the National Council of Teachers of English. Um, we take nominations from, from anybody who wants to give us nominations. We vote. We have 35 members on the committee. They're all teachers of English. We have one statistician and one philosopher on the committee, and we vote. They, what we look for are, is someone who has contributed to clarity in language and public discourse. Nightline, I think, is a good example. Ted Koppel, I think, is famous for saying, wait a minute here, um, can we back up and explain that one for a minute? I mean, he's very good at, at doing that, and we think that that contributes to, to clarity in discourse. Um, we gave it to, uh, to Bartlett and Steele because of you know, revealing that, that intricacies of that tax law were needlessly done and that the language was deliberately opaque to give special tax breaks to a lot of people and corporations. That's tens of billions of dollars worth. We think that that's important that people know about that, that this language is being used to take money out of their pockets because somebody's going to have to make up for that uh, missing tax revenue. So we're looking for people who contribute to honesty in language, clarity in language that way. Okay, uh, the recipients of the Double Speak Award, same group give out... Yes, the same group. We exactly vote each sure. year and uh, from the nominations that we receive, and we try to give the award to, as a symbolic award to an American public figure who has used doublespeak that has consequences of some kind on public policy or a public issue. Uh, in 1989, we gave it to Exxon Corporation for calling the uh, 35 miles of shoreline in Alaska environmentally clean when reporters pointed out that there was still oil all over the place. Uh, an Exxon spokesman said, well, Clean doesn't mean that every oil stain is off every rock. It means the natural inhabitants can live there. Let me go quickly through the list uh, through the 80s. 80 was Ronald Reagan. 81 was Alexander Haig. 82 was the Republican National Committee. 83, Ronald Reagan. 84, the Department of State. 85, the CIA. 86, NASA. 
87, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, and 88, Defense Secretary Frank Carlucci, Admiral William Crow, and, William, and Rear Admiral William Fogarty. A political question to you. If someone read that list, they would think possibly that this is a one-sided award to only one side of the political spectrum. Well, for this reason, the, the Republican Party has been in power for eight years. And so, you know, when Jimmy Carter was in, he got it. So, you know, we, these are the people who have the power to affect public policy through their language. Um, as I point out, Democrats don't get quoted too much these days. They're not in power. If they get in power, they'll be right in there in the list with everybody else. I don't see it. I mean, we, we cited uh, Dukakis during his campaign for his doublespeak, which he used. And if he had been elected president, he'd be in the running along with everyone else. Either Republican or Democratic Party better than the other when it comes to doublespeak? No, they both use it. Um, it, it. It seems to go with the territory. Our point is that, uh, as, as Orwell said, it's political language, and political language tends to, in the 20th century, to be this kind of misleading and deceptive language, whether it's uh, Johnson. By the way, the, the legacy from, from the Johnson administration was the language of Vietnam and the language of the poverty program, which stopped calling people poor and started calling them disadvantaged and stopped talking about slums and ghettos, but the inner city. I mean, that's a heritage of doublespeak from the Johnson administration. Let me go back to when we started this conversation. I asked you, I think in the beginning, is this done on purpose and with calculation? And you said yes. Yes. In fact, I, the, 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 I cite a couple incidents, incidents in the book where I can document it was done. One is revenue enhancement. They had a meeting in the Office of Management and Budget. They said, we need a phrase to replace tax increase. They came up with revenue enhancement. When uh, Lawrence Kudlow, the economist, uh, was asked why they did that, he said, because there's no better way to sell economic policy than the euphemistic route. He was quite proud of the fact that they came up with that phrase. And Peacekeeper, as the name for the MX missile, again, Robert McFarland chaired the committee meeting in which he facetiously suggested that they couldn't name it uh, Widowmaker, could they? So instead they came up with Peacemaker. But later, President Reagan misread his, his cue cards and said, uh, uh, Peacekeeper. And since it was a televised speech, it became the peacekeeper, and it was a name that was deliberately designed to make a nuclear missile sound nice. Does it work? Yes. Oh, of course it works. I mean, most people don't hear it. Um, they will hear some of it, but not all of it. One of my favorite examples from this past year is the resource development park that they were going to establish in Kansas City until the good folks uh, in the neighborhood where they were going to put the park asked, what is a resource development park? Do you know what a resource development park is? In Kansas City, it's a dump. They were going to put a dump in their neighborhood until somebody asked what it meant. They deliberately invented that phrase to try and slip a dump into the neighborhood without anyone noticing it until it was too late. We have just have a short time left, and, and there are a number of things that uh, our audience may be interested in. I've got here in my hand the quarterly review of doublespeak. Is there an organization that you can join if you want to get into this? Deeper? You don't have to join. You can just subscribe to that. In fact, most of the subscribers are uh, you know, civilian public and not even English teachers. It's uh, $8 a year. It's, it's subsidized by the National Council of Teachers of English. So uh, that's why the cost is so low. Where do you get it? Uh, you can simply write to the quarterly review of doublespeak. Um, uh, in uh, Urbana, Illinois. Is this the, I've got the 1111 yep. Kenyon Road, Urbana, y Illinois. Yes. 61801, mm -hmm. National Council of Teachers of English. Mm -hmm. And eight dollars and you're a subscriber. You get and this. you're a subscriber. And what will, what will you get out of this? Uh, I edit it. You will get all the latest examples of doublespeak that, uh, that are sent to me, which I put in there. Articles on doublespeak, uh, uh, book reviews on books uh, of interest, cartoons, uh, short pieces on what's the latest in advertising doublespeak, and I try to make it fun and funny and interesting and entertaining at the same time. You also learn things like how to read public opinion polls so that you're not misled by the results. One last question, your favorite doublespeak word or phrase? The Department of Defense, which until 1947 was the Department of War. The book is called Doublespeak, and it's written by William Lutz, published by Harper & Row, in your bookstores. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.